Our next presenter is Don Tharp. Uh, Mr. Tharp is a graduate of Abilene High School. He has a BS in chemistry and an MS in organic chemistry from Abilene Christian University. He has worked as a chemist and physicist instructor at Cisco Junior College. He was a super supervisor for the city of Abilene Health Department Laboratory, um, has worked at the Texas Department of Health and Texas Water Commission as a registered sanitarian, concentrating in surface water treatment and solid waste programs. Don has worked for TNRCC slash TCEQ in the solid waste, wastewater, and public drinking water program since 1993, retiring in March of 2011. He is currently consulting with the TCEQ Texas Optimization Programs in areas such as regulatory, records review, data audits, monitoring and process control, on-site laboratory instruction, filter assessments, and assistance with plant startups. So everyone welcome Don Tharp. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Uh, Jack and I have been around since before dirt in this business. Uh, I guess 40 some odd years, and that's why I like to give this presentation. We've got an issue. I want to let you know right up front that uh, I live and die by war stories. That's how I teach and how I preach and how sometimes I get to meddle in your business. But the problem with my war stories is that I usually get about halfway through this slide presentation before they tell me I have to quit. And if I cut into Jack's time, he'll never let me know the end of it. It'll, I'll be dead for sure. So let's, I'd like smoking a bandit. We've got a, a long ways to go and a short time to get there. So let's see what we can do. We want to start with the intakes. That's where the water starts to come from. And when we talk about intakes, as you all know, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but there's all kinds of intakes that we run across. Bank side intakes. Uh, we got the, the piers out in the middle of the lake. We got floating intakes, variable level intakes, yada, yada, yada. Some of the problems that we run across for the intake them, themselves is maintenance because they're pretty much out of sight and out of mind. So you're sitting there with this uh, um, morning glory out there that's got three levels of uh, gates on it. Uh, nobody ever goes out there and exercises those gates. So they're either open or they're closed. They're, they're, there's no in between quite often. And some of them have been out there for so long that one of the problems is that particularly that bottom intake gets silted in. So even if you could get it open, you couldn't get anything out of it except mud. But one of the other issues that we look at that I want to talk about a little bit is that we look at what's happening on the watershed around that intake. Jack and I have seen some systems out in West Texas where the water was coming from a rancher's stock tank, and he's graciously letting the city take the water out of that stock tank. The problem is, is the intake's on one side of the stock tank, and 30 feet away, his cows are drinking and standing in the water. Well, that tends to kind of screw up the water quality coming to that water plant, you know. So, and even some of the bank intakes I've seen, uh, same situation, uh, taking water out of a stream in West Texas, it's not more than 30 or 40 feet across. On his side, he's got water coming into bar screens into a uh, collection pit and then pumping it onto town. On the other side of the creek, the farmer and the rancher is letting their livestock drink out of there. So it's a water quality issue about what's happening on the watershed. One of the issues that we try to, uh, or we have to address, or we try to talk about. Uh, sample taps on the raw water lines is always an issue. Uh, watershed control, uh, all of those things dictate what kind of pretreatment process and monitoring that you're going to have to do for your uh, water, raw water. Let's see. Oh, it worked. Raw water meters. Meter types, there are various kinds of meter types. Uh, you know, you can get venturi meters, you've got mechanical meters, you've got electronic meters, and uh, all kinds of things. When you're talking about meters, uh, one of the issues that we've seen in a lot of raw water treatment, a lot of water treatment plants, is that when they take their return water from their sludge lagoons, quite often they don't provide any metering for that. So when you turn on those return pumps, your water flow comes up. Quite often the operators don't realize that they have an issue now because their dosages for their raw water treatment are all screwed up because they, they've increased the flow but not increased the dosage to take care of the problems. 
Some of the other issues that we have with that is that uh, a lot of times uh, when they turn on those research pumps and bring that water in, they're bringing other problems in with it, uh, like manganese <laughs> or water that's gone septic so that uh, the pH and alkalinities change on them. And if they're not on top of monitoring that kind of thing for their raw water coming into their plant, trying to treat for the actual water that's actually coming into the plant, then they can run into some problems and they can lose part of their treatment process. So raw water meters are really important. Another thing that I find that I've got to tell you about, having your raw water meter checked is not a matter of checking, what is it, the four to 10 signal that comes out of that raw water. And a lot of times I know that we'll have people come out and they'll check that four to 10 milliamp signal going to the SCADA system and they call that a water calibration or checking the water. That's not it. You got to strap a calibrated meter on that line somewhere to actually measure the flow and do a comparison to make sure that that raw water meter is properly calibrated. So a lot of times they misinterpret what that, that consultant's doing for them. It took me 40 years to figure out how important this is. <laughs> it's just now coming, coming to me about what kind of problems you can have if you don't have adequate mixing uh, for your chemicals when you add your chemicals to your treatment process. There's all kinds of mixing. You got mechanical mixers, you got static inline mixers, there's hydraulic mixing. I know some of you in here are not old enough to see it, but uh, I don't know, has anybody ever seen a serpentine mixer in here? Well, there's, there used to be, yeah, well, that guy, but then you're, okay, Sandy, you're as old as I am, but, but uh, most of those are already gone, so we don't have uh, have that issue anymore. But you just, we stick a chemical in a pipe and we think that it's automatically completely dispersed in the water that we're treating with. And if we don't get those chemicals completely dispersed, then we have all kinds of issues. Uh, the one that comes to mind particularly is when we're doing uh, chloramination. When you stick that chlorine in that water, there's a cone of dispersion that happens from that stinger or from that quill for you engineers in the, in the crowd. Uh, and it takes a certain number of pipe diameters for that cone of dispersion to spread out so that that chlorine is completely dispersed in the water. Well, if you put that ammonia feed too close to that chlorine feed, you're sticking that ammonia in on top of about, I don't know, anywhere from several hundred parts per million to several thousand. Well, that's a little bit over the four to one it takes, or five to one for the engineers in the crowd, it takes to make monochloramine. So you immediately burn it out and it's gone. So this mixing issue and getting the chemicals completely dispersed in the water as you get into the chemical reactions that take place in the water treatment process is extremely important. Uh, the order that you feed the chemicals is very, very important. Uh, a few years back, we were working with a system uh, east of Abilene that uh, was doing polyphosphate, and they were putting the phosphate in just ahead of the alum. The problem with uh, doing that is that when alum reacts with the polyphosphate, it makes an aluminum phosphate glass-like stuff, and they completely clabbered up their uh, uh, high-service pumps glass the inside of them completely with a with an alum polymer phosphate complex. So if you don't add these chemicals in the prop, proper sequence in the mixing issue, uh, you can run into some serious problems in a water treatment plant. Uh, water quality in the mixing issue. A plant down south of Abilene was installed, a, they went, in, went into membranes, installed a 24-inch line going to their... Uh, uh, ground storage tanks and they wanted to do some uh, booster chlorination in that after the membranes into that uh, uh, ground storage tank so they got their engineers to come in there and the engineers put in these high dollar uh, mechanical mixers that where you inject the chemical down the, the stem of the pipe and it comes out right where the mixers are very very expensive it mixers and uh, so they started feeding ammonia as part of this process for uh, uh, making monochloramine down that line and into right where that impeller was inside that line. 
Well, they didn't take into consideration that they were in West Texas and we happened to have a lot of hardness in the water. So they clabbered up those mixers in about three days because they went to lime softening right on top of those impellers inside that line. It took, it took the engineers three changes of those mixers before they figured out they can't do that. So, you know, if you don't take that kind of uh, water characteristics in, into, into account when you're talking about mixing, you can really end up with some issues in the water treatment process. Oh, uh, this is a, a flash mix without the flash mix. Uh, that hole over there on the left-hand side uh, happens to be where the motor used to be for this flash mix. That's an issue that a lot of times we run across in, in, uh, in plants. The, the maintenance or maybe the cost of replacing parts when, when they wear out just overwhelms the, the system and they don't have the wherewithal to replace those parts, so they just do without them. Well, doing without a flash mix in a water treatment plant, particularly a surface water treatment plant, is not a good thing. Okay, so we run into that kind of a situation quite often. This is an interesting war story. This is a feeder pipe going into a filter system coming from the clarifiers. Single pipe, Noble Johnson and I were working with this system many, well, quite a few years ago. And the operator just happened to make the comment, well, I had to stop feeding caustic. And I said, really, what's the, what's the issue? And he said, well, the P, this, this pipe feeds a, a trough that feeds three filters. He said, well, it was real unusual and I didn't understand it. He said, on my filter over here on this side, he said I was having a pH of like 7576. He said over here on the right hand side, I was having a pH of like seven. And I said some feeding caustic here. He said, I couldn't understand why the pH was not the same. So Noble and I kind of looked at each other and said, damn, what's going on, you know? So I said, well, he's not feeding caustic. And Noble says, well, let's take the Let's take our chlorine test kit, and we'll just monitor the chlorine residual across these three filters down at the bottom. We'll see what's going on. So sure enough, over on the left-hand side, the guy had the chlorine residual. It's pretty good, you know. It's running about, oh, I don't know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. It wasn't bad at all coming through there. Over on the right-hand side, zero chlorine residual, zero going through that filter. Well, you can imagine what that did with his... Uh, CT business and here was what was happening he was putting the chlorine in and through a, a, a I don't know what kind of tap you call it but it's just a tap that's flush with the line and uh, as a result the chlorine was coming in right on the side of that pipe and the flow inside that pipe is uh, uh, wasn't turbulent so there wasn't any mixing in there so the chlorine plume went right up the side of that pipe and instead of being evenly dispersed across that bank, or across that channel in there, most of the chlorine was going over to the right-hand side. And none of the chlorine was going over to the left-hand side. It was a mixing issue. It was laminar flow in that pipe. And he wasn't getting any mixing at all. Even with a stinger, I'm not sure that he would have gotten adequate mixing to really maintain the chlorine residuals evenly across those three filters. Uh, we, he had to do some real issues there to try to resolve that issue. But the issue of mixing of chemicals can be very serious. and It, it can create some issues that, that you'd never think would happen in the surface water treatment business. So it's, sometimes it's something that you really have to work with. Uh, recycle water and sludge. <laughs> well, the, the questions here are the return point. Where does that recycle water come in? And I've already addressed that. If you don't bring it in ahead of that meter, then you're not accounting for that extra flow going through the, the treatment process, and you can have issues with your dosing for your various coagulants and, and the treatment chemicals that you're trying to use. Uh, reports for how much water is coming into that plant is, is an issue. Uh, getting rid of the waste out of a water treatment plant can be a real headache and I'll show you a picture or two here. Is it properly stored? Well you can store it forever if you store it properly on site. Uh, no permits required, you just have to put it in a, in a 
of maintenance so that there's no runoff leaving your site from that from that sludge that you pile up on site. Uh, if you do properly, if you do remove it from site, it has to be hauled by a, a, a certified transporter. The guy has to be licensed and you have to manifest it. It has to go from your plant to an approved disposal site. Uh, so you need to make sure that it is properly disposed of. And then you need to document all that. Where'd that sludge go? You've got to take care of those, the, the solids that come off this treatment process. Uh, here was a little treatment plant that Jack remembers. <laughs> uh, this particular said basin, if my memory serves me, you may have to help me, Jack, but they just, it was an old basin. This plant was a very old plant. They simply dug a pit and I think it was lined with brick or, or some kind of a, a liner. And they really didn't provide for any way to get the sludge out of there. So <laughs> the operators devised this system where they had little floating bars that you can just barely see part of it down on the right-hand side. And I guess maybe it's your left-hand side rather than my right hand. I'm looking at it backwards from what it's on there. Uh, and they'd let that little uh, floating barge run up and down their said basin. And they had the uh, uh, raw water pumps stuck on the top of it. So they'd suck that sludge up out of there and they pumped it to these tanks. And uh, they let it set in these tanks for I don't know how long. And then they would pump it from these tanks to one of these geothermal bank, uh, uh, bags. Well, the first issue, I, not only did they have issues transport, getting the sludge out of, the, out of the said basin to these tanks, but this was the little old dinky pump that they were trying to move that sludge after it set in that in those tanks for three or four days to get it over to the geothermal bag. Well, I, I guess they were doing it because when you look at the geothermal bag, it looked like the uh, Pillsbury, I was afraid to step on it. I thought it was gonna blow up. I don't know how many years they'd had this geothermal bag in the ground, but it was puffed up two or three feet above the surface of the ground. And they had just simply not ever taken any sludge out of it, just pumped sludge into it. So. Solids management out of a water treatment plant is, can be a real issue. Clarifiers are my thing. I love to watch them work. Uh, you gotta worry about what kind of clarifiers you got going and how many of the sizes. Are there special processes involved when you look at the clarifiers? What are their mechanical conditions and how do they control them? Sample taps, where do they take samples to control the, the process control? Uh, Jack's talk and, uh, right after I get finished is about things like that. And then what kind of testing do they do for uh, properly monitoring and managing those clarifiers? Uh, most people generally have at least two clarifiers on site. A lot of small plants only have one. Uh, we're talking about clarifiers. They can either be round, rectangular, or square and what kind they are, you really have to pay particular attention to. For a long time in the health department, and I'm ashamed to tell you this, if it was a round clarifier, it was a solid contact clarifier. Uh, our people were just not adequately trained to recognize the difference between a round, center-loaded, conventional clarifier with uh, peripheral ports on it to take the water away, and to recognize the difference between that and an actual true solids uh, uh, contact recirculation type clarifier. It took a while to get that training in place so that they could recognize the differences. Uh, and even then it doesn't become too, it's not too easy because there's a small plant down south of Abilene that had a rectangular clarifier center loaded and with uh, launderers going across the top of it on either end of where they were center loading this thing. But it was a it was still just an, it was an upflow clarifier because the water went down out of the, out of the center loading area and went out and then up, but there was no solids contact. There was no return. So it was just simply a, a, a rectangular upflow uh, clarifier, you know, but to identify it and, and make the difference between that and a solids contact unit took a little while for even me to figure out. Uh, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer sometimes. Uh, control systems. Oh, let's see. What? 
sometimes they can modify these clarifiers. I, I've seen a lot of, of solid contact units that uh, where they put lamella plates in them to increase the, uh, 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 the surface loading rate so that they can run them at a higher uh, rate and also produce a much finer quality of water when they come through those things. They really work well sometimes. And then, of course, you've got the control systems. A lot of people don't understand that in a, a, a slurry recirculation unit like a, a solids contact clarifier, when that raw water comes into the bottom and you turn on that fan, that, that fan in there not only acts as a mixer, but it really is there as a pump. And at that center column, the water is recirculating underneath that hood sometimes five to six times more than the velocity coming into your solids contact unit. That means if you've got a solids contact unit that's rated for three or four million gallons a day, folks, that water circulating underneath that hood going up that column is going at like 10 to 12 million gallons a day. It's whistling through there pretty good. Uh, and uh, you need that velocity to maintain the energy so that when it water comes out of that solids contact unit and goes out underneath that hood, it's got enough energy in it that it maintains the flocculation process underneath that hood. Without that mixer, it's real hard to call that a solids contact unit, you know, <laughs> to, get it, uh, to get the recirculation going. So the controls for these things are pretty important because that's one of the places where all the rust and the corrosion happens and the electronics inside there just go away. The way we load these basins is pretty, that's a pretty popular. How many of you got calf slobbers on your water in your clarifiers? Come on, don't be ashamed. I know you have them. <laughs> any, any time that you have an organic issue in the lake, like an algae bloom, uh, or if you've, got a, a, you, if you've got a watershed that happens to have some uh, soapstone uh, or some of these soap plants on it, when that vegetation uh, goes away, you're going to have some oils come into that plant that creates this foam issue. Uh, so foaming is not an unusual thing to see. What's unusual is to see how the operators cope with it. Some kind of a spray bar type stuff usually takes care of the problem. Uh, a lot of times it's simply a sprinkler tied on to the handrails around, <laughs> around there that, that knocks that foam down and allows, uh, allows the, uh, the, the uh, coagulant and the coagulated solids to go ahead and settle. So that sometimes is an issue. Sometimes when you go up on top of a clarifier, even though they, they tell you that it's working, uh, what they don't tell you is that motor in that center mixing column's gone, you know. <laughs> and it's real hard to call this a solids contact unit when there's no uh, drive for that uh, uh, recirculation pump down inside that column. That was a real surprise to me. Uh, what was really even more surprising is that after a corner and the superintendent on this plant, that thing had been gone for six months. <laughs> I don't know how they were making any water out of that clarifier, but uh, that's, a, that's another story altogether. Uh, he's no longer with the system for some reason or other. I don't know why. Uh, sometimes loading these basins uh, gets to be a problem. These are two little big old basins that sat side by side, separated just by a single wall. They were fed by a single channel that went behind across the back part of these basins, back there where that railing is, there was a center port that loaded these two basins from one side, one port on one side and one port on the other. <laughs> the operator had the audacity to tell me that he had just drawn sludge out of that basin and cleaned it up within the last week. Now, you can tell, tell me fairy tales all day long. About half the time, I'll believe them. But I really had a hard time, uh, you know, swallowing the fact that he'd cleaned these basins out within the last two weeks. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that the sludge on the west basin piled up on the east side of that basin. You see how that thing is, how the sludge is on one side of that basin? And on the other side, it, it piled up just on the opposite wall. And that had to do with what we call the, the dynamic pressure. Huh? Well, no, they were short-circuited, but why was when, a, when, those, when that water came into that channel back there, it whistled right on past that first basin. And then when, when it hit the sidewall, the end of that channel, it, it builds up a, a dynamic pressure. 
And so it was forcing more water into one of those ports and one of those sides than it was the other. And because it was just a single port in the center of the basin, it, the, the water flow wasn't evenly distributed across the basin. And that's why that sludge was piling up on one side on one, one of the basins and, and then piling up on the opposite side on the other. So sometimes we have design issues that you just have to work with to try to overcome. And sometimes you just can't overcome them. You just have to do the best with what you got. Uneven wanderers. Uh, anytime you have a launderer that, that's uh, uneven, the water's going to flow over one side of it more than the other, and that tends to short circuit it. But really what I put this slide in there, you'll notice that kind of dull color that's underneath the water. Guess what that is? It's sludge. And guess how deep that sludge is? About 10, 12 feet, maybe more. So guess what it is in the bottom of that tape basin? It's septic, you know? And uh, this is a case where we had a solids contact clarifier where they just weren't drawing sludge long enough. <laughs> so again, it's a maintenance and operation issue. Sometimes it's a matter of fact that nobody's ever sat down to try to train the operator to take how to, how to manage the thing. You know, Billy Bob did it that way. And people 10 years before him did it that way. That's the way I've been taught to do it. And he's, nobody's ever sat down or come out and showed him that, that perhaps their operational uh, procedures weren't exactly right for that type of, of solids contact basin. This is another issue that we see a lot. When you bring, those, uh, bring that water out of that center column and you put it out on top of that cone, usually there's a set of gates on the inside of that basin along that inside wall, they're usually set at an angle. That angle's in there pretty important because when that water comes out of that center column and hits that angled gate as it leaves that port, it imparts that spinning motion underneath the bell of that solids contact unit. And that's a very important part of the flocculation process for these solids contact basins. See, I think there's, there's the way that it should properly be set. You see how that gate's set at an angle? And you see how the I call them mare's tails. That's what the old timers that trained me used to call them, is mare's tails. If you see mare's tails in the water like that, then you know your coagulation process is pretty well set where it's supposed to be. But as that water exits that center column and, and hits that gate, it hydraulically it starts that spinning action, which helps with the flocculation and mixing process in that. Now, manufacturers set it when they built that thing because the the contractor had a set of specs that said, set that thing where you had five chain links <laughs> between the hook on the thing and, and on the gate, you know. So it's set at a particular angle that the manufacturer thought it should be set at. But after that clarifier has been there for several years and you have to repaint it, here comes the painters. And when you draw it down, they undo that chain so they can paint it. They got no idea in the world where to set that thing. So what happens is they just leave it wide open. And then you get a situation, I think I've got one. No, I don't. I don't have one that shows you. But the, when those gates are straight open, that, that water comes out, hits that side of that uh, top of that cone. And instead of spinning, it just goes straight down. And you lose a lot of that mixing energy in the process that's so important for flocculation. And then sometimes you see things that you just can't explain. Now, why there was a wagon wheel <laughs> in, in the... <laughs> In the collection side of this basin, I have no idea. The best I could spot, uh, best I could calculate is, is that they were trying to keep the bowling balls from going on top of the filters. That's all that I could tell you, you know. But there it was. Jack saw it. He knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> they didn't. It had been there for God since no, who, who knows how long. But there it was anyway. So sometimes you just really see some very strange things when you at some of these surface water treatment plants. Filters, my goodness. We could spend a, a whole, well, we have a whole 20 hour course on filters, don't we, Jack? So I've got five minutes to spend on a 20 hour course here. What kind of filter do you have? Is it dual media, multimedia? Is it gonna be a biological filter? Is it, you know, what, what, what are we looking at? So how deep is the sand? How deep, how deep is the bed? Is it monomedia? What size are the filters? Uh, what type of inlet do we have? 
is it going to be a declining rate filter or is it going to be a constant rate filter? Uh, it depends on, you know, whether they have submerged inlets or not. Uh, what kind of weirs do we have taking the water out of that filter? Are those weirs level? One of the issues we see with these filters is that way back when, when the plant was built, it was built for sand filters. So they set the height of, of the weirs above that sand media to accommodate the expansion of the bed when you backwash for the sand. So along comes anthracite and dual media filters, and if you put dual media filter in there, well, my gosh, you go from two gallons per square foot per minute to, what, five? So, I mean, just putting anthracite on top of the media, you can increase the output of your filters. That's wonderful. But the weirs weren't set for the proper expansion of the bed. So when they start their backwash procedure, they keep blowing all that anthracite out of the bed into the into the weirs and on out into the sludge basin. So they're constantly having to replace anthracite to maintain the level for the filters for them to operate. So proper design and proper amount, proper type of filter in there gets to be pretty important. Uh, operations. Having a written SOP so that all of your operators do your backwashes basically the same way. One of the tricks that Jack and I used to pull when we were doing MCPEs or OCPEs for the, for the uh, TCEQ, we asked the operators to do us a backwash so that we could observe their procedures. Well, we'd gather all the operators. They all wanted to see what was going on, so they'd all gather around, and we'd start this backwash procedure, and we'd pick on one operator to do it. So this guy would start his backwash procedure, and he'd turn this valve or that valve. And invariably, one of us would get in the back row with one of the older operators and say, is that the way you do that? And they'll say, well, no, that's not the way I do it. I do it this way. You know, and is that the way you do this? Well, no. That's... They didn't have a consistent backwash procedure, first of all. So the, none of the backwashes were, were, were right. And you'd ask them, well, how do you know when to quit a backwash? Well, when the water looks good. Well, what if you backwash at night? Does the good looking water look the same as it does in the daytime? Well, no. So all of those procedures need to be worked out and written down so that all your operators are following basically the same procedure. And if they're not ramping up the backwash and not ramping it down at the beginning and the end of the backwashes, I will guarantee you that they have disturbed the distribution of the media inside that filter to the effect that that interstitial layer between your anthracite and your sand has been expanded quite a bit and you're losing efficiency of the filter process and you're running the distinct possibility of uh, if you slam on that backwash without ramping it up you can lift uh, a filter bottom pretty easy or you can blow the seals out of a filter bottom pretty easy and depending on how well you maintain your filters it may take you a long time to figure out that the, the support media and the blocks, those Leopold blocks underneath there are not properly sealed. And that represents a, a path for pathogens to go through your filter and on out into your, uh, into your clear wells and out into the distribution system. So, you know, the, the kind of filter that you have depends on the operational procedures that you use. You need written operational procedures to make sure that everybody's doing things the same way the procedures need to be properly written. And it's not up to the managers in the system to write the operational procedures. It's up, to, it's up to the operators. They're the ones that do the job. And if you allowed your operators to write the procedures as a group and you oversee it and then okay it once it's done, since they wrote it, it's their procedure and they have buy-in and more than likely they'll follow it. So it's really important that you get the operators involved in the process when you write these procedures for operations inside a plant. Oh, the filter gallery. Oh, well, we can talk here for ages about this. One of the clean, well-lit, dry, uh, a stairwell that goes down there that's not half rusted through so that when the investigator comes there, he has some sense of assurance that he can go down this stairwell without falling into this abysmal pit and never being found again, okay? 
and I have seen some pretty rotten filter galleries, and I'm sure you have too. Uh, the control procedures that you have down there is, is pretty critical. How you monitor where your sampling points are, what kind of testing you do from, from those uh, 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 sample points, very important uh, things that are associated with the filter gallery. I screwed up a really bad time, Kenny, I'm sorry, in that Grimes plant. I don't know if you remember, but you all used to have filter to waste. And your filter to waste was a directly tied to your wastewater line. It was one solid line, which in our business constitutes a cross connection. So a whole brilliant Don came in and said, ooh, ooh, you can't do that. This was back when I was actually doing inspections. And they looked at me kind of funny, said, well, what? What do you suggest that we try? So you got to cut that line. You have to get an air gap there. So they cut the line, and they tried to be, put a big old funnel on top of that line that, so they could collect that backwash water and get it into the drainage. Well, of course, that backwash water came out of that filter so fast that they never could keep it inside that funnel. So every time they backwashed, they, they flooded the pipe gallery. So Don's idea about getting rid of the cross connection was a real issue. So your, your backwash lines in, in the Grimes plant are capped, as I recall. Are they open now? Great. Well, well <laughs> you're, you were four steps ahead of old time. Of course, that was many, many years ago. So I, I can always claim ignorance because I was pretty ignorant back then, wasn't I, Jack? <laughs> all right, all right. You see how this is the way Jack and I, he and I have, a, have this patter ongoing every time we get together. And a lot of times it disturbs people because they think that, that, that we're not, yeah. <laughs> it, it, they don't understand. Uh, this is a very interesting situation. This plant is now gone. This was a line coming directly out of the, out of the filter, turns L's down and goes directly into a, clear well type situation underneath this plant. And the side where the filters are, it, it takes up about a third of this underground clear well and there's a baffle wall. It goes into the other two thirds and on the opposite two thirds of, the, of that uh, clear well is where the uh, high service pumps are setting. So they take suction out of that and push it right on the plant. Now our regulations call for a combined filter effluent. Now, when you put that water straight out of the filter into a clear well, how in the heck are we going to monitor combined filter effluent? They came up with all kinds of solutions for that, none of which really worked very well. They tried to run a line from each one of these filters over to a piece of PVC that was about four foot long and trying to have a combined water from each one of those filters. Uh, mixed in there, and then they tried to put that uh, turbinimeter on that uh, <laughs> piece of PVC and call that a combined filter effluent. Well, it just did not work out. Uh, and the only solution that I could think of is that they put some kind of a sampling port just ahead of that baffled wall and called that first third of that clear well their combined filter effluent pipe. I couldn't figure out another way in the world come up with a combined filter effluent for this particular plant. But this plant has been there before dirt, you know. They, they took the first water that Moses got out of the rock and started treating it with this, with this plant. So anyway, it was a real issue. So sometimes, and I got five minutes and I'm almost there. I'm further along than I thought. But uh, sometimes you just have some problems inside these filter galleries that are just almost impossible to resolve. Uh, that was, their, that was their combined filter, their answer to the combined filter effluent thing, and it just didn't work. And I got to show this one. This is classic. This poor, poor little old plant popped for an MCPE. And I should have known. One of the first things we do when we go do an MCPE is that we put one of our uh, turbinimeters on the bottom of this filter, on the bottom of a filter, and we collect samples, and then we compare our turbidity readings with their turbidity reading for that filter to make sure everything's uh, kosher, you know, between the two turbinimeters. We were putting our turbinimeter on this thing. I looked over 
from the plant and here goes their line from this filter and it runs along around the filter across the ground into a building where they had their turbinimeter set for this particular filter and there was a very strange bulge in the middle of this line i said what's that he said well there was a little inline filter that we had to put there i said well why did you have to put an inline filter he said if we didn't that we couldn't keep the anthracite out of our turbinimeter that was my first clue that we had a real issue here, you know? That was the first thing, wasn't it, Jack? They said, oh my goodness. Well, we drained it down, and it drained down, and it drained down. And when we got it empty, this is what we saw. I don't know how long this poor operator had not been maintaining this filter, but those are holes in the filter going down some, some of them was deep as two and a half feet. Well, the filters, filter media is only about 36 inches. So, you know, we're right down to the gravel support media in this filter. And we threw Noble off in there to try to dig in this filter to tell us what the media looked like. He couldn't break through that crust. So it was a really an issue. And we dug stuff out of there that looked like that. And I can't show you the picture of Jack that I took when he saw this picture here. But it was something like, ah! <laughs> Very similar to that. Uh, and needless to say, things went kind of from bad to worse for this system. Now, I will say that they've straightened this out since then, and there's been some operator training, and they now have a system that's functioning not too, not too badly. So they're well beyond that, okay? All right. Mud balls, another issue. The, you just clabber them up inside that filter even if you use polyphosphate. Now, I'm not a big fan of polyphosphate because I've seen mud balls come out of a filter that a uh, system that's using polyphosphate that were the size of basketballs. You know, so polyphosphate doesn't always take care of your calcium issues in, in the treatment process. Oh, there's another picture of that filter that we were talking about. Uh, bulk chemical storage, it's got to be revetted. It's got to have a drain. The stuff that you drain out of there has got to go to the right place. You can't have non-compatible chemicals in the same re uh, retention thing. So there's issues with that kind of a problem. Uh, day tanks are the same type of a situation. I want to get into chemical feed. Uh, how many feeds do, do you have? Uh, backups for your feed pumps, uh, how many, what kind, are you using chemical feed pumps that are compatible with the stuff that you're pumping, uh, what are your dosage rates, do you know what your drawdown is on your tube, do you have uh, drawdown curves for your chemical feed pumps, uh, things, those are kind of questions that we try to get answers to when we go through the system. And I wanted to show you this, that is not a good example of chemical feed rooms, okay? Uh, I'd hate to be the operator and have to try to get down inside this thing and do any kind of work there. At that same system that had issues with the, with the filter, this was what the top of their ground storage tank looked like. And when you see that, what do you suspect you're gonna see when you get on top of it? You're gonna see a collapsed roof. And right around where that water, that water came up over that pipe spilled down into there. And there was a much water spilling out of that pipe around that joint than there was going down in, into that ground storage tank. And that's a low spot in the roof. When it rains, what collects around where that joint is? Well, it's rainwater. So you got untreated rainwater running off into your clear well because of the damage to the ground storage tank. So we run into issues like that. And of course, we all have run into the issue. I don't know if Jack has. He's not been in the business that long. Don't tell him I said that. but. Uh, <laughs> the guys that swear and be damned that they keep their roof hatches locked. And when you go up there and unlock them, flipping over half the roof hatch is rusted where the rainwater has collected. Don't tell me those kind of fibs. Just tell me that you got an issue and we'll take care of it, you know. <laughs> anyway, that monitoring, where to monitor, what to monitor, how to monitor, keeping records, paying attention to records, that's very, very important part of the uh, treatment process, the, the recording of the data and the keeping of the data. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about disinfection. Uh, I'm gonna go on through the laboratory. I'm a laboratory freak, so uh, I could spend another 20 hours on just the laboratory business alone, but I'm not gonna go there. 
And this is the record type. How many more minutes I got left? I'm done. I, I'm sorry, Jack, I'm cutting into your time. <laughs> but I'm done. And I appreciate your attendance, and I, I appreciate your allowing me to tell you a few more stories about surface water treatment plants. Thank you very much for your attendance. All right.